The Reverend Dr. Richard Trost was a pastor at St. John between 1964 and 1969. He was here during the tornado, and he wrote about a few of the people in his life during that time. He called it Strong Women and a Big Wind. In Charles City at St. John's by the intersection, there were those strong women in the pastor's life. The Mrs. Pastor was strong woman number one. Jacina was number two. Jacina lived just three doors down the street. Jacina was in Ostfriesen. There were a couple dozen at St. John's. It's a variety of low German. Jacina was the babysitter on call. Anna Weisenbuehler was strong woman number three. She would come to the house on Sunday morning and play with the children. All four were pre-Sunday school. She would clean up the breakfast dishes and set it out until Shirley was back home from late church. Anna made it possible for the Mrs. Pastor to sing in Earl Stewart's choir. Now there had been a tornado in Charles City. It just about did in the Trost. They had all been in the midst of it. Shirley and the children had found shelter in the chiropractor's basement. The storm had destroyed the doctor's office and totaled out their station wagon. She and the children had taken refuge in the basement. Over and over again, Pastor Richard told a story about hurrying for home when the sirens blew, then pulling up at the traffic light by the church and trying to wave on the pickup at his right, who wasn't moving even though his light was green. The man in the pickup finally put his arm out the window and pointed up and over at the eastern sky. There swirled that black and evil cloud. The Reverend Richard could make out furniture in it, roofs, debris of every sort. It was the cloud from hell. Richard pushed down the gas pedal of that little red VW and moved up the hill toward home. As he passed by the church, unbeknownst to him, he was passed by the heart of the storm. The winds lifted up his VW for just a moment. The wheels spun, and moments later the winds set the car down on terra firma. That was that. Now he was free of the storm, only he didn't realize it. When he pulled up the driveway of the parsonage, it was with a deep sigh. Scary. All of the sudden, it was quiet as death. The sirens were stilled. He dashed into the house. There was no one there. The wind had rammed a long two-by-four through the outside wall of the breakfast area. The family, wife, and children were nowhere to be found. His beloved Jacina appeared. She was beside herself. A huge tree had fallen in her yard, but her house had been spared. She had talked with Shirley just after lunch. Shirley said she'd be on her way to the chiropractor with the children. Reverend, that's where you're going to find her. Down there where all that destruction is. Three major churches totally ruined. Businesses on both sides of Main Street totaled out. The two of them knelt in prayer. With that prayer in his heart, he gave Jacina a big hug. She said in low German, Jungs hold fast. Boys hang in there. It was a voice from the grave. Richard's mother was calling for action. That was her motto. Boys hold fast. Then Richard took off on foot in search of his family. He found them at the chiropractor's. Even though the top story of the funeral home across the street was on their station wagon, he recognized it. No, they wouldn't be driving home. Yes, the children were all barefoot. He'd carry one of the boys. Shirley took the other. Kirsten was on her own. Watch where you put your feet, love. There's glass all over. Funny thing, you could see the back of their car. The storm had blown an old fur coat in there. When they got home, Anna met them at the door. She knew that three people, members of St. John's, had lost their lives in the storm. She brought dinner over for the family. She knew that the pastor was going to be busy. She had the names of the victims, so as soon as everybody ate a sandwich, the pastor took off on foot. He managed to see all three families. There was consolation, and there was some gossip, and he headed back to the church. The church was a busy place. Starting that morning, the women had been in the kitchen cooking the choir dinner. They were cooking for about 300. It was the biggest event of the year. Each singer in Earl Stewart's three choirs received a rose for each year of their perfect attendance. The banquet tables were heavy with red roses. Of course, no one had shown up at 6 p.m. to eat and celebrate. The pastor showed up. Yes, let's just hold off a little while. Keep the food warm. There are going to be a lot of people in need of dinner. We've got power. Some neighborhoods, as I understand it, are all without power. Let's be patient. I say, we'll go at, at home at 11 p.m. 10 p.m. 10.30 p.m. People began to show up. Can we eat? We're famished. Right now we can't even get to our house. The neighborhood is closed off. The National Guard is there. By 11.30 p.m. it looked as if the banquet had been served. The food was all gone, eaten up. About then the Catholic sisters from St. Mary's showed up. 
They had grocery bags, 11 of them, full of sandwiches they had made. They had raided the freezers in the convent. Jesus was busy feeding the 5,000. This went on for 30 days, 24 hours a day. The kitchen never closed down, neither day nor night. The Lutherans never ran out of food. The church in State Center, their pastor's folks lived in Charles City, in a cavalcade of cars, brought 100 apple pies. Some group from Milwaukee showed up with a semi-truck. They brought their grills and generous supply of steaks and potatoes. All that Sunday, they grilled on the church lawn and fed the hungry, people who wanted to know they were loved and that their brothers and sisters cared. Pastor Richard knew there wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist church in Charles City, but lo and behold, a semi-truck pulled up at St. John's and someone wanted to speak with the pastor. It was a representative of the Seventh-day Adventist church. I was reluctant, but I did it. Yes, they introduced themselves as representatives of their national church. The truck was loaded with used clothing and shoes. Everything was clean and sized and sorted. Their plan was this. Reverend, you're going to receive many gifts of clothing. Some will even arrive via the U.S. mail. They were right. Some had already been delivered. Just put all those clothes in the barrels we have brought that you will empty. We'll be back to pick them up for cleaning and sorting and distribution in another disaster area. Believe me, it works. It did. It did work. I am a believer. I am thankful for their loving, caring witness to the mercy of Jesus. Soon thereafter, two busloads of Amish arrived. They gleaned the farmer's fields. There was household junk scattered all over everywhere. On the first day after the storm, a representative of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, showed up at the parsonage at 8.30 a.m. He wanted to talk. You are in our prayers, and here is a check for $6,000 made out to you personally. Use it as you see fit. No, you will not need to be accountable to us for how you spend it. God will guide you. It's all for the love of Jesus. How do you think they say thank you for that? It's humbling. You weep. You celebrate the generosity of Jesus' church. When all was said and done and cleaned up, families who had been helped with those dollars gave them back so generously that the community could fund and commence a Meals on Wheels program. It's a broken world in need of healing. The disciples of Jesus are there as healing hands and hearts. That was my sermon on the Sunday after Tornado Wednesday. We live in a broken world set askew by sin. The devil is in the murderer, the thief, and the devil can be in the weather. It's a fallen world. It's not just a fallen human race. But by God's grace, it's also a rising world. By grace, God's people will arise and there will be a new Charles City. The love of Jesus and God's grace will prevail.